welcome to our Sunday online service. I'm Jen Melkai. We're thrilled that you've joined us today. If you are new to Trinity, text welcome to 262-302-3021 and Trinity will donate $5 to the charity that you choose. We will have a women's workshop August 10th from 6 to 8 p.m. entitled Letting Go and Letting God. We also have our missions golf outing Monday, which is tomorrow, and there's still room available for coming to dinner. So $20, you can come to dinner and bid on some wonderful prizes. I actually have a golf joke today. Do you know how many golfers it takes to screw in a light bulb? Four. <laughs> we are humbled by your generosity and we thank you for helping us serve the community. And as you know, we always celebrate our 20th online giver and this week it's dun 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 dun, dun. Renee Dooley, congratulations. As we prepare for worship, please make sure you have some bread, some wine, or some juice so we may participate in Holy Communion together. As we prepare for worship, we continue our parable. Our parable has to do with this plant. It's been covered up since last Sunday. No sunlight has gotten to it. What we realize with this plant is if it just is provided water, just once a week for one hour, minerals, sunshine, for one hour a week, it will not thrive. It's similar to we as human beings. As human beings, when it comes to our spirituality, if we just for one hour every one Sunday or two Sundays a month, and that's the extent of our spirituality, we will not thrive. You know, this is the third Sunday we've looked at this plant. From a distance, it still looks kind of green, but up close, it looks very sickly. So for you and for me, we are called into spiritual, spiritual disciplines. Spiritual disciplines include something like this. We provide for you a daily devotional online or in paper. If you read that in the beginning of the day, how awesome. It starts the day connecting with God. At the end of the day, I know I look at my five fingers and give thanks for at least five things that God has brought into my life. Also, studying God's word, being involved in a small group, uh, serving others in Christ's name, and worshiping regularly, they will nurture us. If we don't do that very often, then emotionally and spiritually, we might start ending up like this. We'll see how it looks next week, okay? Join us as we worship and are nourished. Is 
Please join us in our litany for today. The Apostle Paul encourages us not to be weary in doing what is right. If we have become weary in doing what is right, forgive us and renew us, Lord. Give us a new urgency to make you, Jesus, the foundation of all we do. If we have become tired of dreaming dreams and seeing visions, forgive us. Make our joy in following you, Jesus, so contagious that others are drawn to its source and foundation. If our witness has become lazy and lacking in joy, forgive us. Surprise us with joy. Energize us anew to be faithful and joyful disciples of yours. If, if anyone, anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. creation. Everything, Everything old has passed away. away. Everything, Everything has, has become, become new. new. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. In today's reading from Luke chapter 21, Jesus was walking with his disciples in Jerusalem. Some of his disciples were remarking about how the temple was adorned with beautiful stones and with gifts dedicated to God. But Jesus said, as for what you see here, 
the time will come when not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. Teacher, they ask, when will these things happen? And, and what will be the sign that they are about to take place? Jesus replied, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and famines and pestilences in various places and fearful events and great signs from heaven. But before all this, they will seize you and persecute you. But make up your mind not to worry beforehand how you will defend yourselves. For I will give you words and wisdom that none of your adversaries will be able to resist or contradict. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies themselves will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, Stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jack leaned on his father's knee. Daddy, tell me a bunny story. What was that, son? Tell me a bunny story, said two-year-old Jack. One with a truck in it, okay? All right, climb on up, said Dad. Dad begins spinning a tale about a mischievous bunny who gets into all kinds of trouble while zipping around in his great big truck. Every great story, though, has to have an obstacle, has to have a villain, doesn't it? And so Dad begins introducing the big bad wolf to his tale as well. No wolf, Daddy, Jack insists. No wolf. How can you have an adventure story without a wolf? Jack, how does the bunny story always end? And the bunny lived happily ever after, right? Jack covers his father's mouth and in the sternest manner that a toddler can manage, he repeats, no wolf. Okay, Jack, it's okay. No wolf. Already, already at the age of two, the little boy has an understanding of evil. He's afraid of the big bad wolf. Two-year-old Jack was afraid of the pain, the destruction the wolf could bring, and he wanted to make it disappear. Wouldn't it be nice to live in a world without a big bad wolf? 
But as believers in the book, the Bible, we acknowledge the reality of evil. There's no place on this planet you can escape from suffering. Americans were stunned years ago by the attack of 9-11. We hadn't stared evil in the face like that for over a generation. We thought it was a freak anomaly. Who could imagine that a handful of terrorists could wreak such violence? No wolf. No wolf. Some called it the day that changed the world, but nothing really changed. We had just been unprepared for the coming of the wolf. The diagnosis of cancer is the coming of the wolf. Diagnosis of having COVID, maybe a car accident or a fire, the coming of the wolf. A son, a daughter addicted to drugs, and they're suddenly in the room with us in this, this awful monster from which we cannot escape. No wolf, no wolf, we cried. Jesus said to his disciples, they had just arrived in Jerusalem when he warns them to be prepared. Don't be surprised, scripture says, by the fiery ordeal that will come your way. The disciples, oh, they were admiring the beauty of the temple, one of the great wonders of the ancient world. It was massive. What a structure, a tremendous symbol of national Jewish pride. It is said that no sports structure in America today comes close in size and splendor to the temple in Jerusalem. How cool is that? The smallest stones in the walls of this massive structure weighed two or three tons, about the sizes of a huge truck. Many of them weighed 50 tons. The temple was many, many times larger than any building the disciples had ever seen before. They stared in amazement at the temple. At this point, Jesus makes one of the few specific predictions of his earthly ministry. He predicts that this magnificent temple would one day come falling, crashing down. Not one stone will be left on another. Every one of them will be thrown down. This temple symbolized all of Judaism. Just like the Twin Towers symbolized capitalism, 40 years after Jesus' prediction, nobody expected it to happen, but Jesus knew it would. That's exactly what did happen. In the year 70 AD, Titus, a Roman general, with 80,000 Roman soldiers set siege to Jerusalem. It was a difficult city to take, set on a hill, defended to the death. When the siege was successful and the city was taken, Titus ordered the whole city and the temple to be razed to the ground. 97,000 residents of the city were taken captive and enslaved. More than one million Jewish individuals died in the siege. All that remains of the temple today is a portion of the retaining wall. Some call it the wailing wall. You know, the Wailing Wall, of course, is the most holy prayer spot for present-day Jews. You remember, I've been there twice on my travels to the Holy Land. Each time, the night before I visited this wall, which wasn't the temple, it was only the structure that held the temple, the night before, I prayed over every one of your names. And the next morning, when we went to the temple, myself and other members of our church who were with me, we placed your names in the wailing wall, this most sacred of the Old Testament structures. We pray for one another in this congregation during difficult times especially. Jesus' disciples said to him, Rabbi, we can't believe that this temple will be demolished. When? What will be the sign of this? What will be the sign that it's about to happen? Jesus had no use for those who continually looked for signs. He replied, watch out, don't be deceived. 
Many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and the time is near. Don't listen to them. When you hear of wars, rumors of wars, when you hear of revolutions, do not be frightened. These things must happen first, but the end will not come right away. Before the end, there will be many trials. You will experience many tribulations. Nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint with terror, apprehension of what is coming to the world. Ever since Jesus rose from the dead, my friends, ever since he ascended into heaven, we have been in the end times. We're living in the end of days even now. There are constant trials, constant tribulations. Saints and sinners acknowledge that a wolf, a wolf is loose in our world, a wolf that brings heartache and suffering even to the best people. Because of Adam and Eve and the fall, the wages of sin are death. But why does God allow suffering? We don't know. Some think it's the only way God can make us strong through tough times. Earl Woods, you know who he is. Earl Woods is the father of Tiger Woods. He used some unorthodox methods to train his son for success. When Tiger Woods was just a small child, Earl would try to distract him as he went about playing golf by throwing, throwing golf balls at him, yelling at him, getting in the way of his putt. He deliberately disturbed his son's concentration. I bet tomorrow many of you will have your concentration disturbed with our mission's golf outing. But Earl's son soon learned to focus, focus so intently on each shot because of what his father had done that he stopped noticing his father's obnoxious presence on the course. Is that why God allows adversity in your world? To help you and me to develop into spiritual greats? As we fight through life's challenges, we can mature. There is no doubt about it. If this perhaps is why God does not make our lives easier, is that why God allows the wolf to run free? because ultimately it makes us strong enough to bear the heaviest burdens. My personal life has experienced such things as yours has. Where were you back in the summer of 2004? Think back, the summer of 2004. It was August 15th for me. I was having the time of my life. I was in the north woods of Wisconsin with my family, racing around a lake on a, a motorboat. I hopped on a huge tube, and on this inner tube, I was tubing. I was going so fast behind that motorboat that I flipped. I flipped off that tube, and I was knocked silly. Woo! I was flipping end over end, not just once, but several times it was really fun. Well, the next morning I looked in the mirror. As I was about to shave, I noticed that, that I had a lump on my throat. I thought, wow, I better wear a suit of armor next year when I go tubing. But the swollen neck persisted. So I went to a doctor a few days later and discovered that I had several cysts in my thyroid gland. The tubing might have brought it to the surface, but there was a serious problem and I would have to have surgery. I would have to have part of my thyroid gland removed. They would literally cut my throat. Think about it. When your livelihood depends on public speaking, this kind of news will shake you to the core. As I look back, I realize that up until that point, for 24 years, I had spent my life building a faith community in Pell Lake. It would be part of my life's legacy, I realized. 
It was kind of like my own temple. Just like Herod had made the great temple, Jesus said that Herod's temple would come crashing down, and then what would he have left? There would be no earthly edifice. It would be Herod standing alone before God on Judgment Day. That was my experience and will be your experience as well. There I was. There will come a point where there will be huffing and puffing. There will be a straw house, a wooden house, a stone house, but the wolf will blow your house, your earthly house, down. Someday your temple, your corporation, your job, someday your marriage perhaps, your children perhaps, your hobby, your body, your education will be shaken to its core and you will end up standing all by yourself before the judgment of God. If you have put your priorities in the wrong place, it will feel like Herod's temple come crashing down around your head. As I prepared for my surgery, I prepared my heart and reflected on my life. I could die in that surgery. What would I have done with my life, I asked. How had I treated my wife? That night before the surgery as I lay there, I asked, how have I treated my children, my friends, my fellow Christians, and especially non-Christians, and especially those who were upset with me throughout my life? Did I reject them? Did I treat them badly? Or did I turn the other cheek? My goodness, my surgery day was my judgment day. God was preparing me for my end time. It really doesn't matter when Christ returns. If I die today, today is my end time. I need to be prepared. You need to be prepared. I realize that all my hard work in building this congregation with you meant nothing if I had not myself personally developed a positive life-changing connection with Jesus Christ. I might have helped others, but if I wasn't there, if I hadn't been born again, accepting Christ into my life, it was all for naught. This was my wake-up call. The Bible is quite realistic. In this world, there are trials, tribulations, but be of good cheer. There is one who has overcome the world, as for the big bad wolf, here is what Isaiah prophesied. Scripture says, the wolf will lie down with the lamb. Bat, bat. The leopard will live with the goat, the calf, and the lion, and the yearling together, and the little child will lead them. When these things begin to take place, when all kinds of pain and tribulation comes your way, stand up, lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. The big bad wolf is going to rear its ugly head. God allows it, perhaps because we need to be shaken out of our lethargy, our laziness, and get our priorities straight. So, two-year-old Jack, your redemption is drawing near. Do not be afraid of the big, bad wolf. You are not hidden. There's never been a moment you were forgotten. You are not hopeless. You have been broken, your innocence stolen I hear you whisper underneath your breath I hear your rest so wish, your rest so wish. I will 
send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It's true, I will rescue you. There is no distance. I cannot be covered over and over. You're not defenseless. I'll be a shelter, I'll be your armor I hear you whisper underneath your breath I hear your SOS, your SOS On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, on that very last night as he gathered with his disciples, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body, it is given for you, remember me. In the same manner he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he blessed it, and he gave it to them saying, Take and drink. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. As many times as you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, remember my promise to you that I died on the cross for your salvation. And now we remember our Lord and Savior by saying the prayer that he taught us, lifting our hands in submission. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now as you take your communion kit and peel the top off to get the wafer, remember Jesus' words to you. Take and eat. This is my body. And then as you take the cup from your communion kit, remember his words. Take and drink. This is my precious blood shed on the cross for you. And now, may the Lord's body and blood strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Create in me a 
clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with your free spirit. One day a teacher put a large piece of poster board on the wall. The poster board had a little black dot over there in the corner. The teacher then asked, what do you see, class? Everybody shouted, a black dot. The teacher stepped back and said, so not a single one of you saw the white poster board? You only saw the black dot? This is an awful thing about human nature, isn't it? People rarely see the goodness of things or the broader picture of life. Don't go through life with that attitude. Today, I am naturally concerned about the many terrible problems that plague our world as you are. But there's also great beauty in the broader picture. Many people are doing heroic work to improve the lives of their fellow human beings. If I were to forget these good things, it would be difficult to sustain hope for overcoming the bad. May you see that the Lord has blessed you and will keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. Streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of 
service we cover up our plant now don't forget our parable and one of the things that you and I can do is to sign up for reach out 21 we're going to show Jesus love in a practical way because what is our mission to help my neighbor make a positive life-changing connection with Jesus Christ God bless you have a blessed week overflow with joy and peace, and may God bless you.